I know I turned it on. Yeah, there's, there's a light there. Not that I, well, well, maybe, maybe we'll go without it this morning. I'm a camp guy, we can do that. Is there anything else I should do to this? I, I should get rid of it. <laughs> Talk about yourself for just a moment. <laughs> what the heck? There's a thing called unmute and mute. Okay, what did I do with the <laughs> string? All right, let's try. Give that a screw. Um, and, and, there you go. And, um, we go with the handheld. We can, we can do that. that right there. <laughs> Preach the word. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. It's nice that, uh, you know, we're good enough friends that you can be that intimate and uh, put things in my pocket, so that's kind of fun. Um, You're not wearing the mic. It's got to be on your ear. Well, except I'm using this one, right? Try oh. this one for a second. While I'm Check that one out again. Uh, oh, no, not that. It's working, so we hear you. Oh. See, it was hanging behind your back. One of my wonderful people told me it was hanging down here. And, and that makes a difference? It does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have no idea why you're applauding, because all we've done is just shown you our incredible lack of technological abilities. So, and, and actually, you're doing that just to make you feel at home, because, you know, how many times have you tried to make something work and, and the kids come along? And uh, uh, at, at, at my home, we are finally empty nesters. Uh, we, we had a caboose, and then when I got sick, she made the uh, decision to stay at home longer uh, until I was able to be out and doing things on my own. And, and so she's finally left. So after 40 years, we are empty nesters. I hate it. Because usually every evening I would go to my youngest and say, here, fix it. And she would say, well, what's wrong with it? I don't know. <laughs> Figure out the problem and fix it. So, well, it is good to be with you guys again this morning. This has been a joy for me these last three Sundays. I don't know if it has been for you, but uh, I've enjoyed coming. And uh, next week you get your interim pastor, so you'll kind of be a, a, a little more consistent and, um, and, and established, and, and that'll be great. I'm, I'm very, very happy for you. As you'll recall, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Psalm 136, uh, that his love endures forever. So what should my response be? What could it be other than I'm joyful? Because his love endures forever. And then we looked at the very next Psalm, 137, uh, about, uh, well, it starts out by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down and wept. But we remembered Zion. Oh, ultimately our heavenly home where we get to be with our Savior. And keeping that perspective and keeping that in mind, what, what more could we do than to be joyful See, Scripture and the Christian life is really all about joy. Now, I know, I know we, we run into tough things. I, I get that. I understand that. The last two years for me, uh, you know, uh, in, in the midst of all of that um, uh, that was going on for us, we, we finally got up to our, our camp up in Ely, Rock Ridge, and uh, my son-in-law came with to help get the trailer set up because I wasn't able to do that. And we had a gas leak and blew it up. And he spent a week in the hospital and has been dealing with skin grafts ever since. I know, I know tough stuff happens. But in the Christian life, we as believers are to be marked by joy. And you know, you know who taught me that was an 11-year-old kid. Where, where it was a number of years ago, I was at camp, 
And uh, I, that morning, I had been at the front desk uh, working on some stuff. And this kid comes in, this 11-year-old kid, Kyle, comes in and says, Hey, Herb, how are you this morning? I'm, I'm great, Kyle. Hey, I was just wondering if my suitcase had shown up yet. I'm going, wait, what? You're, what? What do you mean? Well, my suitcase. I haven't been able to find it. And, wait, it's Thursday. What, what do you mean? You, you've been without your suitcase and all your stuff you know, since you got here on Sunday and it's Thursday. Your folks are coming tomorrow. What, what do you mean? He said, I, I said, well, what have you been wearing? He, well, this. You know, I, I, and, 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 and I called my program director up uh, from the back. Uh, Hannah came up and I said, Hannah, this kid has not had his suitcase all week long. And, and I was, you know, I, I had asked him, I said, you know, what, did you like fly in here or something like that? Because some kids do that. They fly up uh, to Minnesota and be with their cousins and spend a week at camp and your suitcase just didn't make it. And he said, no, 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 no. I saw it on Sunday. I had it on Sunday. And I had, and we've got to find this kid's suitcase. And, 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 and young man, once you find that suitcase, you need to dump everything out of it and wear everything before your mom comes tomorrow. <laughs> And so he and the rest of his cabin mates and Hannah, they went and searched him for his suitcase. And they looked in every other cabin and that sort of thing. And they finally found his suitcase in the cabin next to his. It had gotten delivered uh, on the hay rack. We used to do it that way to the wrong cabin. And, and, and I remember talking to that counselor, Charlie, and I'm going... Look, this suitcase is like bright red. Did you not notice this on the open suitcase sitting right here in the middle of the floor? He said, Herb, they're middle schoolers. None of the suitcases are open. <laughs> you know, I... So they, uh, Kyle and Hannah and his friends uh, from his cabin took the suitcase outside, and Kyle says, Hannah, we need to do the suitcase dance of joy. And he says, what's the suitcase dancing? He said, I don't know, but let's make it up. And so they gathered around the suitcase, and they did the suitcase dance of joy. Came back to the office and taught it to me, and I joined in on the suitcase dance of joy. And I want to tell you that that is probably the most spiritual thing they could have done all week. Joy. Is ought to be the hallmark of the Christian life. It, scripture agrees with this. Uh, in, in James uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, James starts out with, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What? When you face trials of many kinds, consider it pure joy? Well, that doesn't make any sense, but Peter in 1 Peter 14 picks that up and, and reminds us of the same thing. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Rejoice in suffering? That doesn't make any sense. But it's repeated in 1 Corinthians uh, 12. Uh, Paul says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take away from me this, this infirmity that he had. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. What? Again, that just doesn't make any sense. And yet, when I look into Scripture about what the kingdom of God is like, this, this kingdom that we are all part of, do you know what the kingdom of God is most commonly compared to in Scripture? A party. The kingdom of God that we are all part of, if you are a follower of Christ, mostly looks like a party. 
In Matthew 22, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Okay, little, little cultural transmission here. We're not talking the Scandinavian groom's dinner. A, a, a Middle Eastern wedding party that goes on for three days and there's tons of food and dancing and, and, and food and partying and singing and food. Did I mention food? It, 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 that part is a little Scandinavian. So, uh, but it's the kingdom of God. It's like a party. And then, of course, we have Christ's example. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That makes no sense to put those two words in the same sentence, does it? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I think I can prove this further. If you turn in your Bibles in Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, at the worst point in all, not just of history, but in all of eternity, at the worst point in all of eternity, I think we can find something that we wouldn't expect. Now in Mark chapter 15, verse 33, we read about this dark, dark moment. Verse 33 of Mark 15, At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I've got to tell you, I am incredibly uncomfortable with this passage. I don't like it. I don't like it. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Many of you know that that is not just my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in, in the Aramaic, it's daddy. Daddy. Why have you forsaken me? I don't like those verses. In fact, I would like to cut them out. I would be okay with that. Now, the other things that Jesus cries down from the cross, I love those words. Uh, I cherish them. In Luke uh, 23, verse 34, we hear Jesus looking down at his accusers, and he says, Father, forgive them. The dying Christ says, Father, forgive them. Could any words be more precious to you than those? Father, Father, forgive Herb. He just doesn't get it. Oh, I cherish those words. I love those words that he shouts down from the cross. Could any other words demonstrate his compassion more than those. And, and I love in, in Luke, also in Luke 23, verse 44, I love those words. He turns to the thief at his side, and he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Could any words bring more hope to that man? Uh, remember Zion. That's our hope. We will spend eternity in heaven with our blessed Redeemer. Oh, what words of hope. I love those words. In, in John 19, verse 26, we, we get a tiny glimpse into the incredible humanity of Jesus when he looks down and sees his mother. 
And he says uh, in John 19, near the cross, Jesus stood, uh, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother with his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that would be John, standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, here's your mother. And from that time on, his disciple took her to his home. Let me update that a little bit. He looks down and he sees his dear, dear friend, John. He says, John, that's my mom. Would you take care of her right now? I can't. That's my mom. Boy, I understand. We, we, we see this, this little glimpse into the hum, humanity of Jesus, and boy, I understand that emotion. The last two years of my mom's life, she, she slipped into Alzheimer's and dementia, and, and each time we would go visit her in the nursing home, her world would be a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller, and it was so hard after a visit to leave her and, and I remember telling those wonderful nurses and, and caregivers around her, thank you, because that's my mom. Thank you for taking care of her. We get this little glimpse into the humanity of Jesus. In, in John 19, we hear Jesus say uh, in, in uh, verse 28, we hear Jesus say, I'm thirsty. Boy, we get to see the agony in those little words. I'm thirsty. A number of years ago, uh, I, was, uh, I was an EMT for a long, long time. Uh, retired from that with all this that had gone on. But one of our, one of our trainings, one of our, our recertifications was going on during Easter. And in those trainings, we thought, well, since it's Easter, one of the things that we learned about and explored was a crucifixion. Do you know that crucifixion is not meant to kill you? Crucifixion is not meant to kill you. It's meant to keep you alive for as long as possible in as much pain as long as possible. That's why the guards would come around afterwards and bust their legs so that they couldn't push themselves up at all and get a breath and they'd pierce them with the sword because they weren't dead yet. And one of the things that happens in, in, in a crucifixion is, is, is a, a cardiac tamponade. There, there, there's this this uh, a gathering of water around the heart and, and, and just squishes the heart in. Uh, congestive heart failure, it, it's just squeezing against the heart and that's why uh, when, when they stabbed Jesus, out came water and blood because they went into the, 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 the sack around the heart first and all the water comes and then the blood from the heart. Uh, and, and what happens is you get very, very dehydrated. All of your bones come out of joint because of the way that you're hanging and, and all of the waters gathering around your heart. And Jesus says, I thirst. Incredible, incredible agony. And at the end, he says, Under your hands I commit my spirit. What an example of incredible abandonment to the obedience of God. And, and, and if Jesus abandoned himself to God and was obedient, how, how much more so should I be? What an example. I love all of those words, but these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't like I understand it theologically. I understand that God couldn't look on sin and there was this tearing of the Godhead that God had to turn away. I, I, I get it theologically and mentally, but I don't understand it. If God could forsake his own son, surely he could, should forsake me. And as hard as all of that is for me 
to grasp and understand what must it have been like for those guys in the first century. Gathered at the foot of that cross, seeing their Redeemer die. They must have been so distraught and confused and in so much pain and despair. And then I'll bet, and I'll bet it was a kid, I'll bet someone goes, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Those words that Jesus is choking out with his last breath, those words sound familiar, don't they? Have, have you ever had that experience where you're hearing some song and, and, and you can't quite remember the words for it? And when, when someone finally gets you started, then, then you, I, I have that experience all the time because I'm terrible with song lyrics. I can't remember them. And, and it, you had that. And somebody, I'm sure, was there in the dust of that cross saying, wait a minute. I know those words he's saying. That's, that's a song. That's a song. In fact, you can find it in your Bibles, hymn number 2022 20, in, in your Jewish hymnal, your book of Psalms. Look at how that song begins. As I've said before, the worst hymn ever written. It starts out with, my God, my God. You better turn to it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, I can surely see why that doesn't become one of the top ten hymns in the Jewish faith. I mean, try to sing those words with any kind of tune and uplift. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I used to have Psalm 22 in my hymn. No, I wonder just where it went. It's like a microphone. It doesn't want to work. Got it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. We don't have time to go through the entire psalm, but look at verse 7. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Doesn't that sound like the crucifixion? In the crucifixion, we're told that all of those soldiers and some of the others uh, you know, were hurling insults at him. They mocked him. You, know, you said he could tear the temple down in three days and build it up. Yeah. Hey, why don't you call out to Elijah? You know, and hurling insults at them. That's in the song. Look at verse 9 of this song. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Doesn't that sound like the incarnate Christ? The God-man who came and became one of us but knew God before? It's describing the incarnate Christ. Look at verse 14. Um, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Wait a minute. That happens in the crucifixion. My heart is turned to wax. It's melted away uh, within me. My strength is dried up. My tongue sticks, sticks to the roof of my mouth. I'm thirsty. This whole thing is describing, this song is describing a future crucifixion. In fact, the crucifixion. Look at verse 16 if you have any question at all. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil, evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. People stare and gloat over me. Look at this. Verse 18. They divide my garments among them and cast lots on, for my clothing. It's a song about the coming future crucifixion. 500 years before the Romans invented crucifixion. The Jews in the Old Testament singing this song would not completely understand it because crucifixions hadn't been invented yet. And yet it's a song about my Savior, my Redeemer's crucifixion. I'm convinced that while my Jesus was hanging on the cross with his last gasps of breath, 
He's singing. He's hanging on a cross and singing at the worst point in all of eternity. But read the rest of the psalm. It's a song. It starts out really strange, but it's a song of victory and of celebration and of joy. Uh, well, the last verses of the song. Verse 30, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. What's the New Testament equivalent of that? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. And what are the last words, the last sentence of the song? For it's finished. He's done it. At the worst point in all of eternity, my Jesus is singing, and it's a song of victory, and it's a song of joy. I miss that last uh, sentence that Jesus shouts down from the cross, didn't I? He shouts down, it's finished. And then he gives up the ghost. The last thing he says is it's all done. It's all taken care of. Stop worrying. Stop fighting. Stop striving because it's all finished. It's taken care of. My salvation is complete and taken care of because of what my Savior has done on the cross. It's all about what he has done. And when I know that, what else can I do but to sing and to dance for joy? All of these terrible things that happen to us in life, all of these difficulties and trials can be absorbed into what Jesus has done on the cross. All of life that happens, even the hard stuff, Jesus understands. And he won't leave us. I tell kids all the time that are struggling with parents splitting up, is that I know... I know, I don't have any answer for you, but I know that my Jesus can absorb it all and he will never leave you. Therefore, we can be joyful. He can wrap his arms around us and absorb the pain of death, even your own. Hmm. Jesus will walk with you every step of the day. And knowing this, what more can I do but to sing and to dance? At times it might be a slow, intimate dance, but it will be a dance. His love endures forever, so let's rejoice. Remember, Zion, we will spend eternity with my Savior. So let's rejoice. It's finished. All of the frustration that you as a congregation have dealt with over the last few years, it's okay. My Jesus understands that and he can absorb all that so we can keep on going with joy and singing. And when the community looks at Lake Community Church, is that the first thing that comes to mind? Is man, those people are ridiculously happy. That's what will be so attractive to them. Are you teaching the joy of the Lord? Are you teaching kindness? Romans tells me, Romans chapter 2 verse 4 tells me that it's the kindness of God that leads me to redemption. Hmm. Are you teaching joy? Is our focus on believing that all that has gone on goes through the hands of my Savior first and we can rejoice and the community will go, wow, that is so different. Are you dancing? 
Yeah, you should be. Because this congregation has a bright future. Number-wise, I don't know. Who cares? You as a congregation have a bright future, and therefore we should be celebrating. And I suspect that that will be attractive to others, but that's not the point. The point is, do I know the joy of the Lord? Are you dancing? Uh, I'll even go so far as to say this. If you are not by nature, by being a new creation, if you are not a person of joy, then I question if you know my Savior. Because if you know him, everything else gets put into perspective and you can experience the presence and the resulting joy of my Savior. Let's ask the worship team to come on up while I close us in prayer. Thank you for letting me be with you these last three weeks. I hope this isn't my last Sunday here. It's uh, if you can tolerate another Sunday and need to fill in, I'd, I'd love to be with you because this congregation is important to me. Uh, I've known people in this, in this congregation for a lot of years, and uh, it's been good to be with you. Let me pray. Father, thank you that indeed you put everything into perspective. Father, thank you that when we compare all that goes on to knowing you, our response can't be anything else but joy. Father, teach us again to sing and to dance. Amen.